Good morning. As you've heard, my name is Liesl. It's lovely to be with you all this morning and with those who are watching us online. And before I start, be a little bit naughty, I want to say happy birthday, Jane. A little birdie told me it's her birthday today. <laughs> I am a follower of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we continue to do what Jesus did. We follow in his footsteps, in his way. In John chapter 14, we see Jesus is going to go away. And the disciples are anxious. And they want to know if they can follow him. And Jesus tells them, you know the way to the place that I am going. One of the 12 apostles, his name is Thomas, and he was the grumpy apostle. He asks, how can we know the way? And Jesus replies, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to know how to get to the Father's house, come with me. And this morning, we're going to look at the way of prayer. You can put the next slide up for me. <laughs> this is a picture of how we as Christians can sometimes be before God. We like babies who know to cry when they are in need or when they don't get what they want. Some people see prayer just as the way of getting things from God. Asking, asking, asking. But prayer is presence. We choose to be in the presence of the Father. And there's nothing wrong with asking Him for things because our God, our Father, is a good Father. And He loves to bless His children. He loves to give us good things. But what He's really after is a relationship with us. You see, God's intention from the very beginning was to create us for relationship. Think about Adam. God created Adam so that he could walk with him in the cool of the day and have a real relationship with him. And a real relationship with God means walking with him daily like Adam and Eve did in the garden. It means talking with him intimately, like Moses did, with whom the Lord would speak face to face as one speaks with a friend. And it means listening to his voice. Because as Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. It means that he knows me and I know him. He speaks, I hear, I speak, and he hears. You see, it's not one way, it's a dialogue. It's an ongoing dialogue. Pray is how we develop our relationship with God. Now, it's, I think it's impossible to have a relationship and not talk. I'm married to you, hon. We talk a lot. I think he'll probably say, I talk a lot more. <laughs> but we wouldn't have a relationship if all I did was ask him, ask him, ask him for things, and never listen to him, never spoke to him. See, we got to know one another when we were dating. And we got married, and our relationship has developed, and it's grown stronger, and it's grown deeper, because a close relationship requires communication, both listening and talking. So if we understand that prayer is how we relate with God, not just how we use Him, then it makes sense that we integrate our conversation with God into all that we do and every moment of our day. John Wesley described prayer as the breath of our spiritual life. If 
you're struggling in your spiritual life, or you pray, you need to breathe. Prayer is the breath of our spiritual life. Prayer is talking to God about, we think, about what we're thinking, about what we're doing together. Now let's be real with one another. For many of us, prayer is a weak point in our walk with Jesus. Maybe you feel guilty about how little you pray. Maybe you don't know what to say to God. And maybe you're just busy, you're distracted on your smartphone. If you struggle with prayer, you are not alone. Pete Gregg, who founded the 24-7 prayer movement, he started the first 24-7 prayer room 24 years ago. And why? Because he figured that prayer was important and we are really, really bad at it. So why is prayer difficult? Maybe you don't pray because you're afraid of doing it wrong. You listen to the eloquent prayers of others and think, oh, I can't pray like that. You share a, a story of mine. Many, many years ago, I was uh, in a prayer meeting back in our church in South Africa, and we were all praying, and I, I, it was on fire, and I, I wanted to pray, and I, but I, I was in my head, I was practicing what I wanted to say. I was thinking of words that I could use that sounded super spiritual. I was more concerned about what people would think than actually about praying. And I started to pray, and as I started to pray, I, I, I stumbled, I mumbled, I stuttered. The words couldn't come out. I said, God, what's going on? And God said, I'm after your heart, not your words. You see, God isn't assessing our prayers. He's talking to his children. There may be many reasons why you find prayer difficult, but one of the key reasons is we live in a very busy and a very materialistic world. And it can make seem, prayer seem difficult and sometimes even pointless. We suffer from hurry sickness, a sense of time urgency. You feel rushed or anxious. You've got a feeling of urgency to get things done unrelenting busyness. I've experienced a season of struggling with my prayer life. I've allowed the busyness of life to crowd out my time with the Father. Now the Christian philosopher Dallas Bullard once asked, was he was asked, what do I need to be spiritually healthy? And he paused and he thought about this, and then he responded, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. You see, he understood that hurry is a threat to prayer, to a threat to the way of Jesus. Does that ring true for anybody? It does for me. Corrie ten Boom, she was a Dutch woman who saved many Jews from the Nazi Holocaust, and she said, if the devil can't make you sin, He'll make you busy. If you think about it, busyness or digital distraction or overload and exhaustion, hurry, whatever you want to call it, it has a very similar effect on our soul as does sin. To walk with Jesus is to walk at a slow, unhurried pace. And one of the first things we notice about Jesus when we read about him in the Gospels is that he was really, if ever, in a hurry. So this leads me to two questions. What did it look like when Jesus prayed and how should we pray? What did it look like when Jesus prayed? I believe he prayed because he needed to. You see, Jesus was both fully God and fully human. He had a body and a soul, and he lived his life on earth as you and I are to live, and makes his prayers relevant to us. And prayer appears throughout all four gospels, but Luke, the gospel of Luke, is sometimes referred to as the gospel of prayer because it has more to say about prayer than any of the other gospels. 
And it's as if Luke is opening a window for us. He's opening a window on the importance of praying in Jesus' life. Now, Jesus was intentional about praying, and we see glimpses of him praying in just about every situation you can think of. He prays when he's joyful. He prays when he's in agony. He prays with others around him. He prays when he's alone at night, withdrawn from others. He prays high on a mountain, and he prays when normal life happens. You see, prayer was the center point of Jesus' life. He was dependent on the Father. Luke tells us that Jesus was praying at the beginning of his public ministry when the Holy Spirit descended on him. Jesus prayed to overcome temptation. In Luke chapter four, he was going to go face to face with the devil. And what does he do? He arms himself with 40 days of prayer and fasting. In Luke chapter five, he prays for others. In fact, in this instance, he prayed for a man with leprosy and he was healed. And then straight after that, Luke 5, verse 16 reads that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. You see, he just healed this man from leprosy, and the crowds were coming because they'd heard about it. And we see that as being successful. But when things are going well, we may be tempted to think we can get along without praying. But instead of enjoying the applause of the crowds, what did Jesus do? He prayed. We pray in a crisis, but how often do we pray when things are going well? Jesus knew the source of his strength, prayer. He lives a life of communion with the Father, and many times he removes himself from the crowd, and he hunkers down one-on-one with the Almighty. Jesus could pray as a sprinter, or as a marathon runner. Luke tells us in chapter six that he spent all night on the mountain praying. Why? Verse 13 tells us, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 of them who he designated apostles. You see, every one of the 12 choices that Jesus made to make disciples the next day was according to the will of his father even the choice of Judas, who was later to betray him. These are the apostles that he would trust with his entire mission, and that was worthy of all night prayer. Are we praying for those important decisions in our life? Jesus knew that not all his prayers would be answered as expected. As we reach the end of his life, when he's facing his death in the Garden of Gethsemane, He prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Doesn't that line sound familiar? Not my will, but yours be done. It comes from the Lord's prayer. It's a mirror of the Lord's prayer. And then with those prayers, he went to the cross and he died for us. So how should we pray? The disciples recognized that Jesus connected to a source, a deep source, and they saw that, and they wanted that connection for themselves. Let's read Luke 11, verses 1 to 4 together. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Luke 11, verses 1 to 4. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Prayer was the place where Jesus' eyes were opened and his steps directed. John 5 verse 14 says, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. And the disciples say, Jesus, teach us to pray like you do, Jesus. Theologian N.T. Wright says, 
when Jesus gave his disciples this prayer, he was giving them part of his own breath, his own life, and his own prayer. This is key. He was giving them his own prayer. And it's an invitation to share in the prayer life of Jesus himself. In other words, when we say the Lord's Prayer, we don't just say it, but it says us as well. It teaches us who God is. It teaches us how to pray and what to pray for. And Luke's record of the Lord's Prayer is shorter than Matthew's, and we'll look at, at Luke's one. But we see the Lord's Prayer. It's not, a, it's not something that we have to repeat and say word for word. We rather see it as a model. It's a framework for our praying. And because we know it so well, we can take it for granted. Knowing it by heart doesn't mean it's in our hearts. We need to learn its lessons of love. And it starts with Father. Jesus says, start by remembering who you are talking to. Who is your audience? Knowing that God is your Father is the key to getting started in prayer. Open each prayer you pray with the knowledge that you are talking with the Father. You see, the words of this prayer, these first words, our Father, they're about relationship. Jesus is a relationship to God, but it's the same relationship that Jesus offers to us. To call God Father in the same way that Jesus did is to enter into a relationship with God. See, we are children of God but this is only possible through what Jesus did for us. We approach a father whose justice has been satisfied once and for all. He bears no grudges. He's never distracted from listening to us. And in this relationship, we found ourselves profoundly loved and we begin to live as a child of God's kingdom. And because of the victory of Jesus on that cross, we have the same access to God the Father as Jesus has. The same access. Each time you pray, you come before the Father clothed in the robes of Jesus. In his book, Praying Like Monks and Living Like Fools, Tyler Statton says, in the eyes of heaven, you are filled with Jesus' status and standing. Amen. Jesus is the Son of God, the Father's one and only Son. But he wants, to see, he wants us to see that we share that intimate relationship that he has with the Father. In John 20, 21, Jesus says to his followers, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So when we say Father, we remember Jesus' mission and what we are called to as well. We are signing on for the kingdom of God. And when we realize that, we don't just want to pray, we need to pray. And we remember who God is at this point. We say, Abba, Father. And then we move to hallowed be your name. And hallowed means to be known and honored as holy. You see, our Father reminds us about the intimacy of God, but hallowed reminds us about his majesty, his incomprehensible greatness. In Revelation 4 verse 8, there, there's a vision that John has of heaven. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We pause to worship him. We seek his face. We long to see him and know his presence. And we worship him despite our circumstances, despite illness, despite anxiety, despite failure, whatever struggle we are facing. When we worship him, we bring heaven to earth. And we focus on him before our personal wants. So when we come to worship him, spend a few minutes 
in the presence of the Father. You might want to sit in silence. You may want to say a song or sing a worship song. Or just tell the Father about the things that you love about him. Your kingdom come. Yeah, Jesus is turning our attention to what interests God. You see, our culture today is focused on me, me, me. What's in it for me? But you see, God has his own prayer list. And that prayer list is that we pray for the coming of his kingdom. And what are we praying for when we pray for God's kingdom to come? Firstly, it rules out any idea that the kingdom of God is just a heavenly kingdom because we are praying that God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. And this is the same vision at the end of Revelations. Not men being snatched away to heaven, but the holy city coming down from heaven to earth. N.T. Wright says that God's space and our space are integrated at last. And we know the kingdom did come with Jesus, but will fully come with Christ's return. And when we pray, your kingdom come, we are stirring up our own desires for that kingdom. And we are called to partner with God in establishing God's kingdom on earth. Start with me, Lord. Use me to extend your kingdom. You see, when we are praying for the kingdom of God, we are praying for the salvation of the world. And God advances his kingdom through our prayers. So yeah, we spend a few minutes asking God's will to be done in our city and our church, our workplace, our community, and our life. Now, if you look at the structure, you would have seen, hello be your name, your kingdom come. But now we move to us and our. God focuses us on him and then the focus moves towards us. Give us each day our daily bread. Now, daily bread refers to our essential needs. Give us what we need to live and cope. And when we pray for our daily bread, it reminds us that God is in control, not us. And God wants us to ask. Charles Spurgeon noted that this rule even applied to Jesus. In Psalm 2, God says to his own son, ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. James 4 verse 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask God. So when you're praying for your daily bread, it means praying for your needs. Your needs, but others' needs as well, because this is our, not me, not our, our and we pray for ourselves, our family, and other people in our community, in our church, for healing, for wisdom, for decisions. And then we move to forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Now this is one part of the prayer that he did not need to pray for himself. Jesus did not need to pray this, but we need to confess. And you might say, why does a Christian need to say this prayer? You see, when we came to Christ in faith and repentance, were we not justified fully and completely? But the point of this prayer, it's about our fellowship with the Father. You see, sin clogs up our relationship with the Father. And so we pray this because we wanna walk more closely with Him. Too many of our prayers lack confession and this is a prayer of believers, of followers, asking God to search our hearts. Search my heart. What does the Holy Spirit reveal to me? And confess it to God. And confession brings healing. And when you receive forgiveness, then we release forgiveness to others as well. It's a daily call to forgive. And lead us not into temptation. At the beginning of his earthly ministry, Jesus contended with Satan in the wilderness. He withstood every single attack and he remained victorious. You see, Jesus knows the evil and the deception of Satan and we need to call on his strength and his power against the enemy. 
Augustine, he's the ancient church leader and he was a theologian. And he said that lead us not into temptation is a prayer for deliverance from the evil that remains within us. We recognize there's a reality of evil in our hearts. But more than that, we wanna breathe in the victory of the cross, knowing that our sins are forgiven and the enemy is utterly defeated. We pray against evil, and we pray also for God's blessing to flow over us. On the last night of his life, Jesus said this to his followers, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. John 19, verse nine. How do we remain in Jesus' love? By prayer. Prayer, Max Licardo says, it's the window that God has placed in the worlds of our, heart, of our world. Leave it shut and the world is a cold, dark house. But throw back the curtains and see his light. Open the window and hear his voice. Open the window of prayer and invoke the presence of God in your life. As I was preparing for this message, I had a picture and that picture was of flames, and the flames were growing higher and higher, and I had a sense that they were touching heaven. And those, those flames were our prayers, and they were on fire, and they were touching heaven. I believe Jesus is inviting each one of us to come closer today, to choose to make time to be in his presence and to seek him out. Maybe you are struggling, and you're feeling distant from God, but know this, that even now he is waiting, he is longing to hear your voice again and to walk with you. Can we finish today by standing together and I wanna say the Lord's Prayer. It's a slightly different reworded version of the Lord's Prayer, but let's say this together. Dear Father, always near us, May your name be treasured and loved. May your rule be completed in us. May your will be done here on earth in just the way it is done in heaven. Give us today the things we need today and forgive us our sins and impositions on you as we are forgiving all who in any way offend us. Please don't put us through trials but deliver us from everything bad because you are the one in charge and you have all the power and the glory too is all yours forever, which is just the way we want it. Amen.